Welcome to the Broken Lens Podcast. This is Adam Stutz. And I'm Heather Watson. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. A lot of um, exciting things happening for me, so yeah. um, which I'm, I'm pretty stoked about. Yeah, I was lucky enough to join your um, virtual reading with White Stag for your book, so it was yeah. really cool to, to hear you and some other authors read yes so you have some other stuff coming up too right yeah yeah so so um to give our listeners some context like uh i have had two books come out um with white stag publishing congratulations uh, thank you uh sham tapestry and compunctions and thefts and i was really grateful to um my publishers uh Courtney Jamison and Tucker Jamison for uh, taking on two manuscripts, uh, which was really cool. And both of the books turned out beautifully, and I'm very happy with them. And I'm glad that they are now out in the world. It was a, a long slog because we had a lot of formatting and um, printing challenges, but we somehow managed to to get it together and and uh, and get it out. And that was a testament to their um, patience and and really working with me on it. Yeah, and that's kind of a, a good practice run for us anyway to to know what we're getting into with publishing as well. Absolutely. And what's really cool is that um, one of the books is a smaller uh, pocket format, which is the format that we're interested in utilizing for Broken Lens. So. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's a it's great that we have uh, this really wonderful object that we can you know uh, utilize. Yeah, perfect sample. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the Zoom reading was great. Um, I was joined by John Michael Bloomquist and Hannah Taywater, and it was um, really fun. Um, I love both of their writing. Uh, as our, some of our listeners may know, John Michael Bloomquist is also um, one of our contributors. And we will be having him on the podcast in future episodes. Um, And he does really great uh, visual poetry in addition to, um, I guess, what you might consider to be more like traditional poetry. But the the poems that we've um, published most recently were these really beautiful visual poems. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it was great. It was a, you know, it was a small, intimate group on Zoom, um, but I think it made for a good reading experience. And then we are shifting our attention to doing a live reading at Palm Grove Social in West Jefferson in uh, a matter of a few weeks. And this is in uh, Los Angeles, of course. So for all of our listeners that are based here in, in L.A., um, we would hope that you'd be able to come out and join us. It'll be Saturday, September 21st at Palm Grove Social. And I'm going to be joined by Carlo Lamb, Ingrid Calderon, and Jimmy Vega. And it should be a wonderful reading. I'm, I'm really excited about it. So Yeah, I'm excited to be there too. Yeah. And hopefully there'll be other opportunities to read um, around the county and then Um, As some listeners may know, uh, AWP will be in Los Angeles next year, which is going to be awesome. And there will be a myriad of events happening all across the city. And um, so it should should prove to be a really, really great experience. So for this week, uh, we interviewed Ivan Salinas and Jesse Tovar, and we are we are really happy to you know discuss publishing once again. This is another publishing roundtable episode. I really enjoy doing these episodes. I love hearing from other publishers. Um, I think Ivan and Jesse have a very unique story about like how they both got into publishing through zines and activism and both have this really great punk rock ethos uh, that I think they bring to publication. Yeah, they were just wonderful guests. Um, They're also doing a lot of um, engagement with the community. And uh, I just, you know, I can't recommend enough um, reaching out to them to find out more about their, their publications. Yeah, and just hearing them talk about platforms that they utilize to publish things and other conversations that we've had in previous episodes as well. It's just such a testament to the idea that poets and artists and creatives will basically go to any ends to get their stuff out there and to, you know, spread a message and and opinions and that kind of thing. You don't have to fit within the mold of traditional publishing to Mm -hmm. sort of get your ideas out there and and just hearing them talk about publishing via Twitter or using Substack, stuff like that. It's just, it's a really cool format and platform and challenge 
um, yeah. to face to to yeah. express yourself yeah it's very definitely cool. yeah and it just i think for me it reinforces kind of what we're doing with broken lens and publishing the journal online and i think it helps make it a more ubiquitous publication so i'm i yeah i was really really grateful to to speak with them so here's my interview with ivan salinas and jesse tovar thanks for listening Jesse Tovar and Ivan Salinas, welcome to the Broken Lens Podcast. We're glad to have you guys here. Hello. No, thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, start by asking both of you how both of you got into to publishing. Where where did you start and, and you know, what were kind of the seeds of, of that getting in, into the publishing process? I'm excited to hear Jesse first because I, I want to know that story. Oh, me? Well, oh, yeah, because I, yeah, cause I'm just kind of, like, brand new at this. Be- before I decided to, like, do a literary journal, I was in talks to take over a literary journal, but then that kind of fell through, and to be honest, when that, when that fell through, I kind of felt a little bit relieved because I was like, how am I going to, like, have the money to, like, take over an existing journal that's been around for, like, six years? So, yeah. So then, then there came a time where I was writing um, a literary series in um, Pasadena for two years. And Yvonne was actually one of the features for that reading series. And then once it ended, I was only at the time just doing like some IT uh, work for some events at the li- LCD in the library. So I was just wondering like, how, um, well, this will probably end soon. So after that, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to like, what else I'm going to do? Or if I'm even going to be able to be around again, because like, you know, life and all. So I figured, you know, I'll just start an online literary journal um, to just kind of like stay, you know, up to date with like folks that I've gone to know over the years, especially, you know, running the um, literary series in Pasadena. Like, for example, with Yvonne, um, before he featured um, there, um, I actually met him at the Sims Poetry Library. Um, and I already knew of him because of uh, his work with Drifter Zine and all the cool stuff that he does. Um, I know that he's done both styles of like the printing where it's like you're you know, traditional bound for like books and then even like to where it's just like more zine style like this. Mm -hmm. Like this is uh, his uh, dealer um, zine right here. And even like the more foldable ones, like he's also best known for. Yeah. Nice. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's really how I started in in publishing through zine making and self-publishing. And this was in 2019. 2020 when I first my I, I made my first zines and it was thanks to my wife now um, who was my partner at the moment and she introduced me to the format of zine making and how it's this whole pop cultural phenomenon mm-hmm. and I, I didn't know I was doing things like that even in my teenage years of compiling what I would call songs, because I would write <laughs> lyrics, but um, eventually evolved into wanting to make books of uh, poetry, like any a couple of poems that I had laying around, and we would then um, have the uh, material to make a, a small chapbook. And it started out with a zine of writing about weed, <laughs> like, <laughs> and and then it, it, you know. In 2020, it changed the tone into also be paying more attention to political issues and uh, identity as uh, Mexican American, documented, Chicano. So that's really how it it started. And um, my partner and I decided to make a a zine where we could have contributors. Um, you know, uh, submit to to the publication, and we called it Drifter. It was actually uh, after a, a poem by Arthur Rimbaud. Mm-hmm. It's called Vagabonds in in English, but oh no, sorry, in, in French. <laughs> it, mm-hmm. It's called Vagabonds, but I I like the sort of translation mm-hmm. that um, John Ashbery chose, which was Drifter, mm-hmm. and I I like that it's it's stuck and. Um, after that, it's been history. You know, we put out a at least uh, seven issues uh, or eight. They're all on a theme, and that's really what we enjoy. That each one is very different 
from the last one and we choose a theme to help people get inspired but also there's a specific subject that we may want to talk about mm -hmm. and we want to amplify that in, in various ways so um yeah it's been a cool journey and zine making and self-publishing these past three years or so yeah yeah do either of you feel like there is a significant difference um between doing a physical you know publication versus publishing online like do you what do you feel like are the benefits and the drawbacks because i know that like obviously if you were physically printing something um it's going to take up time and resources and you know and and it's an expense but there's also and i i think you know, Yvonne, you alluded to this kind of in your comments that there is something about having like a physical copy of something to be able to like hand to somebody. And that mm -hmm. in a way is kind of a cool method of being able to like bridge community and stuff and like building community, you know, is being able to like hand something that that serves as like a memento. It's, it's you know, because I have a number of zines that I have, you know, tucked in plastic sleeves that I keep on my shelf because of the fact that they hold importance for me. And so um versus online which you know also has its expenses associated with it but it's kind of easier to maybe to like you know spur of the moment put everything together publish it like that sort of thing so i was wondering if i could get your, either of your thoughts on kind of how that you know like how you view you know one and the other oh for sure for sure so with me um everything that i do and kind of like some uh just like you adam it's online um I will say though that my expenses at the moment for running um online are just when I um get when I pay contributors. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, that's about it because uh I uh, purposely look for platforms that are free to use and user friendly because I'm not exactly like tech savvy and whatnot. Um and then with me having like the other so I have two journals by the way. So once uh, mobile data mag on a uh, Substack, which mm -hmm. is a free uh uh, like newsletter subscription based uh site and uh mm -hmm. systemic dreaming on threads which actually when i was thinking about going into like becoming like a literary journal um threads is perfect because um i wanted something similar to like a uh there's a there's um one and i'm sure there's other twitter uh literary magazines out there but the one that stuck out to me the one i know of right off the bat is um the liquid split that is um run by chen chen and kudama yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah now then it's a great it's an interesting format that you that you bring up because of i think of like the space constraints on some of those platforms and so so that's an interesting constraint that you're you're utilizing like in the formation of your of your journal but it also in some respects because that's how we consume so much information these days it mm -hmm. makes it very digestible and, and approachable um Yvonne, what what are your thoughts on, you know, kind of the like debate between maybe like an online publication and, and doing like a physical? Yeah, I like both, definitely. And to comment also on like Jesse's approach with mobile data mag, I like also this sort of um, inbox uh, newsletter style of receiving poetry. I think I like that more than receiving, um, you know, your day-to-day -day emails. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this break in between stuff you, you need to take care of for work and but you also see a new poem uh by a writer that you may or may not know mm -hmm. and it's very important that uh you can enjoy this poem right and i think that also with online and, and poetry specifically really what counts is the language um and it's like i'm, I'm enjoying the poem no matter what mm -hmm. and uh, even online you can do some things to uh, work with the format of it um, maybe you can also talk about that Jesse of like you know like concrete poems um, work that is a bit more experimental with the page right and I, if you've received submissions like that but with uh, with print I think that is a, a kind of a, a pro that you can uh, work with material that is experimental and uh, laid out on the page as, as it's intended to be yeah, I guess sometimes there there is some difficulties with that too mm -hmm. but because online is immediate you also like i think of it of those benefits is if i'm looking for a writer mm -hmm. and if i will know more about jesse for example or even you guys and if a lot of your stuff is on print 
maybe it might not make it to the online mm. format and mm. it's actually harder to find. And I did experience that with a few journals. But yeah, there is like this, it, it exists on print, but it's a bit harder to find or you definitely have to purchase a copy of it to read mm. your work. But if it's on a website, you have a profile or uh, a little bit of like this digital record that mm -hmm. is helpful for yeah. organizations, curators to find your work. So yeah, with Drifter, we have the we have the print format, and definitely we pay attention more attention to that. Uh, even though our zines are available online for free, mm -hmm. but it's not as searchable uh, yeah. to find a individual writer. So we would also have to pay attention to uh, archiving that mm -hmm. material uh, more elaborately so mm -hmm. that you find it. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's just that with print also there's a design element mm -hmm. that Maddie really loves to explore. So when you pick up our zines, you see this like heavy visual aspect to it that we can explore rather than that, that feels different from online. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm what just came to mind for me was thinking about the fact that like going back to the idea of like a zine as kind of this memento so there's like Xena's artifact and and something to you know to seek out so if you you know catch wind of somebody's publication and then you're like you know really stoked that you know like someone has a copy of it you see it and then you're like oh man like I really want to get like the next issue of that or something but you have to kind of go seek it out so there's like the treasure hunting aspect of like being able to like seek out a zine which I think is a is an interesting um aspect of the physical process but then um jesse you had mentioned substack and i've i've also seen a number of publications one that comes to mind um most recently that i feel like is utilizing that is um only poems like they they utilize it pretty heavily and then there's um another substack that i i remember as well um that that i had subscribed to and there are people i follow on there um surprisingly the musician patty smith uses substack actually quite a bit like uh, she regularly posts on Substack and shares poems and videos and all kinds of things. So it's interesting how these platforms are being being utilized by poets and by publishers and stuff for expanding awareness around it. But then sometimes I do wonder about like there being something lost in the process of digitizing poetry and and you know and that's some coming from someone who you know, whose entire journal is, is online and, you know, mm -hmm. only, it only has a digital footprint. And, um, I wonder about, about, you know, what, it, what is lost in the, in the process by, you know, uh, by just being solely online. Um, but, you know, there is the, the ease of use and being able to like push stuff out as like quickly as possible. And to your point of on, like being able to have, a uh you know kind of a, a a library record of multiple poets and stuff and being able to like seek like seek poets out um makes it makes it great to be able to have almost like a like a database um you know that that's mm -hmm. in there um can either of you talk about what your favorite aspects of publishing are um i you know i i realize it might be kind of a fraught question because i know my uh i had my recent interview that i did with uh, clark allen and um jared harvey they were both you know oh, very, that one. very quick to point out the things they didn't like about the publishing industry mm -hmm. so i you know but there were a few things that they that they liked and and maybe not so much like the publishing industry per se but just like like the publishing process like if there's something in there that that appeals to you for sure what i'm doing at the moment um and i'll probably still keep doing it still keep doing it no matter what is that I was able to build like all the people that are on uh, mobile data magazine systemic dreaming by solicitation, mm -hmm. just like getting to publishing folks that I've gone to see in open mics or different readings. And whenever they agree to do it and I'm like, Oh, I'm like, so very thankful, you know, and mm -hmm. Yvonne's of course, one of them, Jerry, Joseph, uh, Harvey is also one of them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Jared, Jared's a, Jared's a great friend. And, um, and I was, uh, uh, very, it was very cool to see like what he and, and Clark Allen did with uh, Rose Mask very recently. Um, it's a it's a great book. Um, oh, yeah. Clark Allen uh, is uh, the publisher of that. Yeah, yeah. So Clark is Clark is the uh, publisher of Five Nine, and um, he did 
did Jared Jared's most recent book, and yeah. Oh, he was, okay, yeah, because yeah. I have Rose Mask here at the store, but I didn't know that he was the person behind Five Nights. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, but yeah. I didn't, I, guess I didn't get that clear in the interview. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, which is a good note for me. So I <laughs> probably need to <laughs> clarify that more. But, uh, but yeah, he, uh, yeah, they they put that together, and um, one of many things I liked about that process was just the fact that they. Like Clark worked with a local printer um, to be able to generate the book, and and the printer did such an amazing job on the books. I mean, they're beautiful, and and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And the reason um I I'm gonna say uh I want to say more to that is because I currently work at a bookstore right now called mm -hmm. the Libros, mm -hmm. and they're also trying to they also have a press too called Life of Publications in here, and they're trying to you know get some books out on the ground and they sometimes go with that place alco in glendale mm. to print out proofs and so do uh, other local presses that i know of um personally as well yeah, yeah. and they love the work that they uh, put out for proofs even yeah. though sometimes they'll just use them just to print out um local copies anyway because of like you know they're like well fuck it you know yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yvonne, is there is there something about the about publication that you can speak to that that you enjoy? Yeah, it's mainly reading through submissions. Every mm. time we put out a call for submissions, and because it's a different theme, we are getting very fresh uh, perspectives on on that set theme. And a lot of the times, it's writers that are local, but we haven't had a chance to to meet, and it's like. Yeah, just a surprise to one that it resonated with them. Um, like lately, I've been working a lot with a writer named Maestro um, over in, in Highland Park. And a, a year later, we are, you know, collaborating on a zine. Uh, we put out a zine together with uh, two other poets. And the first time I encountered his work was was through Drifter. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, it was just a, like a glimpse into... Uh, other of uh, more of his work that I wasn't aware of, and you know, yeah, shout out to Resurrection Press. Yes, that's uh, an Ingrid Ingrid Calderon and John Collins venture that do amazing work with handbound uh, yeah. work and, uh, publications, mostly a lot of Ingrid's work, and it's admirable, you know. Yeah, Ingrid's awesome. Yeah, but it's yeah that submission process i look forward to every time we put out a call and just seeing what what will surprise us yeah yeah i you know it's funny because i i i like the submission process and i'm always like you know looking forward to see what's going to surprise me but then i also dread the submission process because it means that i have to oftentimes make very difficult decisions that i don't like to make and you know and and as writers we all understand that you know like the rejection is part of the process but it's still painful to do that and you know to to not only receive it but also to have to be the one to do it and not really having necessarily a good outlet to explain to the person that we're rejecting like look you're not a bad writer you're not a you know like you just got to keep going like you know this is just part of the part of the the evolution of your your experience in the publishing industry and i always think about that you know as i go through submissions and stuff but then it also feels really good when you do get to finally send like an acceptance to someone and they like write back and they're super stoked and it's just mm -hmm. you know and it's such a great feeling to be able to give that opportunity to someone jesse you had a you had a point that you wanted to make about that yeah so i was gonna say that as of right now because the way i'm doing the the, the tula journals because in general for me i hate surprises so that's why i'm like uh this is why i like when people just say yes and let me publish them right. because <laughs> as of recently uh, i guess someone put me on uh, or put mobile data mag and systemic dreaming on dual trope and now i'm getting complete random people that i've never met before and heard of before and and i've only received a few of them that i put on there and then there was recently I had to um, reject and that was what you guys are just saying to like, it was just a very dreadful and difficult experience. And yeah. 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 I remember uh, when we just launched Broken Lines and um, I had to, I sent a rejection to somebody. Um, it was a much older poet and, you know, I, I was not familiar with their work, but they had, they had, you know, fairly extensive publication track record and stuff but i you know i just like didn't think it was the right fit 
and I got a really nasty email from the person back, which was, which was, you know, right at the start. And, and, and I was just astonished and ultimately it was very entertaining to me, but it was like, it was just kind of remarkable that, that someone would, uh, especially someone who clearly has a, um, you know, a, a publication record, uh, would be that, that feeling that burnt on a rejection, but it, it's strange. You never really know what's going to, you know, like what's going to happen, what's going to set somebody off. But I, I, yeah, I, I and that's interesting, Jesse, because I, I've been, we've been exploring using Duotrope and, and, um, Duosama for like our, our, uh, submission process and stuff. And we're probably going to be moving over to that because currently we use like a Google form and there's a lot of spreadsheets and stuff to like try to track things. And it's a very messy experience and a lot of kind of administrative work and thing about, you know, submittable is it's just so expensive to, to use that platform. Yeah. And so, and I know it's like the gold standard for the industry and everything, but it's just, it's, it's so pricey. And, and what's great about like Duo Sum and like in, and Duo Trope is that they only um, charge you based on kind of like the number of submissions, like for like for a given period, and so it's like it has a much more competitive, like pricing structure to it that's like far more affordable and, and everything, but it's also you know to say that the number of resources out there to be able to help smaller journals that maybe not like don't have like institutional backing and don't have like deep pockets and stuff it it's hard i mean like it's hard to do that and so you're left you know sending people emails and trying to organize those emails and and having you know i remember uh before i had started the journal when i used to send stuff out and not get a response back for like months and now i'm like now i understand it because you're just you know you're getting like total uh you know like totally bombarded at like all times by so many different people and like being able to uh you know and and sometimes just like to respond to like get like cut the list down and stuff it's crazy so like um you know so i've been i've been going through a backlog <laughs> for for a while and i you know if there are any listeners out there who are hearing this and stuff please know that i am going through your submissions as quickly as i possibly can i really am and i really do care about each and every one of them and i'm trying so hard because i really I really want to make sure that they, uh, you know, that we, that we attend to them. Um, one thing I wanted to, I guess, like maybe on the flip side of this is, can can both of you speak to what you don't like about publishing and like what you, you know, what are the things that that are fr like frustrating for you? And maybe it's not about your publishing experience per se, but maybe it's just about like publishing, like the publishing industry at large and like, you know, like, you know, what your concerns are about that. Yeah, I'd say for starters, the first thing that comes to mind is the scarcity of uh, places to have a um, your material printed that is cost effective. Mm -hmm. We mainly use a website called Mixum to print out our color zines, and in the past three years, th those prices have only gone up mm -hmm. and up. <laughs> um, even in the early days of our uh, of our venture, like. There, there was a scarcity of paper, even. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we got these messages that, that that was happening. And it was due to the pandemic, but it might be that just, uh, you know, these resources may become more more scarce. But I hope I hope not. But that is something that we've really had to work around. And I think of supply, right? Like, how, how are we going to uh, get this in people's hands if we can't afford it? Um, we have definitely thought of you know, doing fundraisers, for example, or something like that. But we first want to build community and then think about the, the product as a secondary thing. But it is something that, yeah, I don't, I don't like on, on top of, um, on top of sending out rejection emails. Yeah. Like, you know, even though it's a necessary step or element in the publishing, whether you're submitting or being the, the one as a, the editor. It is difficult no matter what and uh we we do dread that part but i still like reading <laughs> the submission yeah um even when it's like visual artwork but that that is like a frustrating thing because it would be great to go to van nice and uh support a local publisher uh, sorry a local uh, printer right but it, it, every time we've 
product on that for what we want it's really pricey yeah and it just comes to well we have to do something uh where it's printed somewhere in the east coast or even out of another country mm -hmm. and it has a like a bigger carbon footprint and yeah. you know we don't see these things but it affects how how we get this the, these zines with us you know yeah yeah i mean that's first thing that comes to mind but yeah jesse what about you um right now um there was one piece that i was actually well actually that's not true it's happened a few times with substack um where for with the pros piece um you know how like some people when they write like their stuff and they want like their paragraphs indented mm. mm -hmm. so with substack it doesn't let you do that they just have everything all like in a long rectangle and i know like for reading purpose for people that love prose for instance like they like to see the indentation of paragraphs and mm -hmm. and it's like it's and it probably makes people upset when you don't get to see that so one way i had to get around that for some pro submissions is that i have to like put the prose uh into a certain format on subset called the uh, poetry block and that's where i can you know indent the paragraphs oh. and it's like why do i have to like go through the trouble of doing that for prose you know yeah, absolutely. And I, um, it's, you bring that up and I, I would not be able to put like publish our journal without like my, my business partner, Heather, um, who is, you know, the mastermind behind all of the technical stuff on our website. Yeah. And she had to, you know, when we first launched, she had to learn how to like do code and to be able to do a lot of the indentations and like kind of changes in font sizes and other like, you know, unique formatting things. And, you know, Yvonne, you had mentioned earlier about like kind of more experimental like pieces and stuff and things that have like kind of a more interesting like visual um, component to them. And, and that's something that we really want to also be able to like try to honor is that, you know, um, is that people who, who don't necessarily follow, you know, a tr more traditional formatting um, sequence and stuff to like make sure that they are that their piece like we're, we're kind of honoring what the piece intended to you know to look like and it's you know and it's it, it sucks when you can't do that because it's like you know like i and i'm sure i've had many pieces rejected myself because of the fact that like i drive my my editor crazy because of the fact that i'm a guy who like my formatting's all over the fucking place and like they can't you know like I, i'm sure it's a huge headache for them so um, so I appreciate what they have to go through to like try to like get everything that I do like onto the page correctly. And I also appreciate like, you know, from our, our standpoint, and I could see how like in, you know, Yvonne, like in a, a physical journal, your physical zine and stuff, like you have a little more control over like being able to kind of play with like the formatting and stuff and being able to, you know, work with uh, layout. And, and I guess that like leads me to, you know, my next question is just about like the design process and stuff. Like, is there, you know, cause that seems like that could be a really enjoyable process, you know, like do like working on design and, and doing layout, you know, some people might hate it and like, I, you know, and I could totally see that too, but like, I would think like sometimes it's also, it could be really interesting to like, just sit there and just be like, you know, kind of like, how do, how do, how do we want to get this like set up on the page and stuff like for printing purposes? <laughs> I'd say to start with, uh, with that, um, I think there's two parts on my end because, uh, there's the scenes I make, uh, for my poetry zines, a lot of it, those I design myself. But then with Drifter, Maddie, my uh, editor in chief and partner, like she mostly takes care of the of the design. And even I wonder if that is her favorite or her least favorite part, which I think is both. But um, the the pleasure comes once it's done. But mm -hmm. the process itself is like so dreadful. But I'm just like looking at a proof of a zine that um I, I just made and she's been helping me do the layout. But you see this like one here and eight over here. And that's like the process to see what what content is going to be in each page. Mm -hmm. And I I like the design. It's just that it takes a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I have this idea in my head and I wish I could just snap uh, my fingers and it gets that it gets done but i think that yeah it, the more elaborate the design is with um the inside pages having 
artwork and stuff, the more difficult it is to yeah uh, to work with it and have the product finish. You know. The thing I was gonna say too is that um with systemic dreaming, um there was one poem that I put up like last year, that for some reason like Threads was just acting weird, so I had to like screenshot it, and it was within the five hundred characters, but Threads was just being so weird that I just had to like screenshot it from a Google Doc and just post it up as a picture. And then what I decided to do like in January was like one day just repost it up again mm -hmm. and it actually worked. But what I had to do was just have the title by so-and-so separate as one thread and then the piece itself as uh, an entire thread on its own. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's and again, this goes back to kind of what we were talking about earlier about the fact that you're working within the constraints of the platform. And it's interesting how the how some of the issues that you might encounter on a platform might end up re you know, reframing the work or like causing, you know, like causing certain issues and stuff like in layout that you might not you might not encounter in like other, you know, another format. And so I yeah, it's it's interesting because I, I think about design a lot. But um, like Yvonne, you had mentioned, like, like, I'm the same way, like, I, I kind of like, I will see something in my head, and I know how I want it to look. But then like the actual execution of it, especially when it comes to publishing other people's work and stuff can be like, kind of hard. So that's why, why I'm grateful to, you know, my, my business partner, because she is able to help facilitate that because I mean, I really would not be able to do this without Heather, like, like I would be, I would be struggling big time and stuff. And, and I'll be the first to admit that it is a team effort and, and a half. So, but like, we're trying to utilize, you know, like the, the journal as like a stepping stone to, um, you know, launching a press to be able to start publishing books and, you know, and like being able to help facilitate that. And, and I wonder about that for both of you, you know, thinking about like, is there, um, something in the works, like where you want this to be an evolution into like a larger, you know, publishing, uh, company, like, a you know, to be able to like produce more like hardbound books and stuff and like being able to, to do that. And if either of you could, you know, kind of speak to that. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Joseph. Oh, I was going to say, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, Drifter Z did, did do both styles. Like they did like your, like bound, like your soft cover bound and the, zine style where it's like stapled and the copy of the one i had was suburban wonderland that was uh, done in soft cover bound and that was a really cool issue by the way um and that one i ended up giving to uh, joel kaplan when i first met her at glenlow college and she loved it too and i'm sure she still has it in her house uh to this day or something yeah out in the wild <laughs> but but yeah what about the evolution of um yeah, Jesse, do you do you feel like like do you want to like eventually like move into like publishing books and stuff or like, you know, based on like the the journal or like or is it something that you're like you just like you just want to do a journal and just kind of like keep keep that going, like keep that moving? So, so a couple people have told me that what I should do is maybe make some zines to promote um, mobile mm -hmm. data mag and systemic dreaming. And I probably will maybe do that at some point that I know if I were, if I do, if I am going to do that, I'm going to have to start paying for like prints and all that. And then somebody else told me that made their own zine that they didn't realize that you have to like put the page numbers on the paper in a, in a way that where it's foldable because it's mm -hmm. not like a straight across as a digital, um, ebook format so you have to like be um be mindful of that mm -hmm. um but for the most part i'm gonna probably just stick to um just staying digital because like again i still don't know like if i'm gonna even be around the, in the writing scene um actively because of like future work or mm -hmm. future family needs or whatnot so yeah yeah mm -hmm. what about you yvonne yeah i mean it's just hard to know what's what's coming you know to predict the future but i hope like that we all stay in in this world in this uh, publishing side of things but yeah we really um started to think about our, a press name and wanting to solidify more of a press through drifter like right now i put all my zines under paloma press mm. which uh, paloma is really just pigeon in, in spanish and uh, Maddie loves pigeons and you know just this idea of translating it like 
came came to mind as well and it has a good ring to it so with paloma press even the some of the self-published work i have kind of like resurrection <laughs> yeah and then pitching can be sassy <laughs> like this way to put out chat books uh either of my own work or work of other of, of other writers but i've understood that like in order to be responsible for somebody's writing mm. i have to be a little bit more um experienced and i can do whatever with my own work but um before taking on that role i'm gonna publish your chat book you know give it some time because really we're young in our publishing ventures um mm -hmm. three to five years like yeah it's um still a very early set you know and and just in our experience like i just started making zines about four years ago so letting that mature a little bit and just keep exploring it as a zine making mm -hmm. um, it's great rather than jumping right away into wanting to publish a full collection of someone mm -hmm. someone's mm -hmm. work right Absolutely. so that's where we're at but yeah that is the the vision to mm. to have that and, and eventually even like uh having a space or like a bookstore in the valley because we are based here and and see the necessity of, of having that uh headquarter space mm -hmm. um for for us and for the people we publish even outside organizations that we can collaborate with mm -hmm. so we need that kind of network but that that's all like a step-by-step -step process and i think right now really what we're focusing on is paying more attention to the website mm -hmm. and see how we can expand that side of drifter zine mm. maybe it's publishing more work online but also because we're not just strictly a literary journal Mm -hmm. We also publish some journalistic articles or essays. And I think having some of that in there as well would be really beneficial and a way to expand the readership of, and vis visits to our website. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think that's the, the next step outside of just the quarterly zines we put out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, um, I, I wanted to get your thoughts, um, Yvonne, on your you know experience because in addition to being a, a publisher and editor and a, a poet and writer in your own right you also work at beyond baroque um you know and uh you are responsible for putting together these you know incredible programs do you find you know like one thing i, I know a lot of like publishers are trying to you know try to figure out is do you go like the nonprofit route and you know kind of like create like a nonprofit and stuff and then you know you're kind of at the you know you may be at the mercy of like funding and donations and those sorts of things but there's also there can be potential benefits to that versus uh you know um working in like a for-profit space and like kind of like creating like a net you know like a business out of it and i i was wondering like kind of like your experience uh doing that and like whether or not that's kind of like influenced your perspective on it yeah Certainly that debated on that because there's so many different perspectives from people we ask. And even my own experience working at a nonprofit, I see the pros and cons of it. And really it's, um, I think, uh, the, the nonprofit model to be um, a model in which you, you make it what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. You can completely adhere to uh, funders the people that give you grants you can adhere to everything they tell you or ignore it a little bit <laughs> work mm -hmm. around it and not have to compromise your ethics it is government funded and there's going to be things that if you are radical they might not like it and mm. and if you've seen drifter zine's whole uh mission and even the cover images that we put out yeah a lot of the time maybe that won't fly in a grant proposal but yeah because of that i think more of uh the community to be uh funding us just through the publication uh, the cost of publications and all of that but i don't know much about the nonprofits uh model that i'm trying to learn just mm -hmm. by working uh, at a place like beyond broke and being surrounded by other nonprofits and mm -hmm. seeing how they develop their their systems mm -hmm. and Right now, we're still on the side of 
Mm. It's it's just a process we're thinking through, but there is uh you know both both sides of the coin to that you have to think about. But I do see like this string strings attached a uh, like phenomenon with funding from big philanthropists mm-hmm. organizations and i think also the i guess one thing about drifter is that our mission is not to be an extension of the of the city mm-hmm. of the of a government branch mm-hmm. so i don't mm-hmm. we need their money to be yeah. honest yeah in fact it's kind of like a criticizing what, of what of what they enact mm-hmm. so yeah we we should be careful with that of course and um because of it we have just been a bit undecided but have uh simply relied on people's support yeah direct support yeah jesse what about you like had like working at libros and and like you know kind of that experience has that informed say for example like you did decide like oh like you know i, I do want to jump into starting to publish books and stuff and 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 go beyond the journal and stuff do you feel like working at Libros and like, you know, like kind of your experience and stuff there, like has that influenced like how you would would potentially fund a venture, um, you know, for publication? Yeah, because um, right now, because they're more of an LLC format, like most small presses are mm-hmm. um, there. It's coming out of pocket from the person that's that owns the press that is renting the the space mm-hmm. which um my boss always says is 500 uh, square feet or less or whatever and uh yeah for me like let's say if i were to uh, ever publish like books like that i would feel like i would realistically need to have a job and possibly if i can get a job as a professor um to just be able to do that and maybe like one of those like well i well, Lampert to pick, I can't even say the word now. Be like, oh, well, that's just a side hobby, and this is my passion. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I I understand that because, I mean, everything that we do through Broken Lens is, is paid out of pocket. And, 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 you know, and I have a day job that helps facilitate this and stuff, and a day job in an industry that is completely anathema to my personal politics. And so, yeah. but it pays my rent, unfortunately, and, and everything else. And it's it's hard i mean it's a you know it's kind of a reality that you butt up against because you know as i um, mentioned in my conversation with jared harvey and clark allen um you know there are other countries where there is uh, ample states funding for arts that you know helps uh, facilitate those things and my model for that is always ireland is like a really good indeed like like example of a state that goes out of its way to ensure that like you know that they're supporting their artists um but uh jesse you had a point on that yeah um the reason i want to elaborate on that too is because i've had other people tell me even those that come to the liberals tell me when i tell them that oh i have my own literary journal um that is separate from legacy publications that um oh you should become an llc like your boss or you should do, become an LLC like you're the other presses that you carry here. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that because there's a cost in starting an LLC mm-hmm. and then trying to maintain it and all that. It's like, and then you have to like do a different set of taxes for that. Mm-hmm. And then you have to like do, and then you have to like be mindful of tax write offs on your receipts or individual receipts. And like, I don't really want to have to like think about all that stuff. It's like, it's very tedious. And I don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just did my taxes uh, this year. Because I was a, a a state caregiver for a few months in 2023, and it was easy to just do the traditional, um, you know, taxes that way, mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, you just put in your W, your 1040, and that's it. Yeah. Whereas when I do uh, Uber Eats, because I still do Uber Eats to this day, um, it's a 1099, but even that's easy enough, where I don't have to like enter like additional expenses yeah. or additional tax things or write off, you know, mile. I didn't even write off miles for Uber Eats this past yeah. year because like I only did it for like two months this, in 2023. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. I want to just like keep my life simple in terms of taxes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's why it's like I don't even want to like think about LLC this, LLC that because like yeah. when people tell me that it's like they're looking to look for a way to benefit me or benefit themselves by trying to encourage me to do this. So it's like I don't really need to benefit no one. And I like what I do right now with the literary journal like the way it is like having like people that I've gone to know that are cool and that I've had drinks with or had dinner with or whatever. You know, sure. you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. 
Well, and, and both of you have really emphasized, and, and I think rightfully so, the importance of community. I mean, really, that's a, like the kind of the crux of a lot of this is this is about community and about like community connection, community support, community activism. I mean, there's so much tied up into the, the history with publishing, and, and it's such an important element in terms of being able to establish those connections. And um, and it is, it, it is fucking expensive. It is like, it is fucking expensive. It is, I, you know, we are a, currently we are not an LLC. We are a sole prop and I hate doing taxes. I mean, it is unbelievable because I have to track all these expenses and like we have to put them into these ledger things. And, you know, there's like these income statements and stuff that, you know, and I have to have somebody help me and that's extra money. And like, it's, it's not, it's not cheap. And I think that's, you know, maybe going back to like what the community aspect is, is like, you know, trying to figure out ways like new systems to be able to, you know, for presses to support one another and being able to like kind of like we I have friends who have like kicked around the idea of like, you know, the creation of like a general fund or some type of like, you know, establishment of an organization where there could be essentially like some type of insurance or something that can like help support other presses or um, publications that might be struggling. And so um, to be able to create some type of community funding like that, but it's hard, it's hard. And everybody's like scraping by and trying to like, you know, deal with cost of living, especially in Los Angeles, which is just like absurd. So, um, you know, and, 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 and that goes for a number of other places, but um, I wanted to switch gears and, you know, talk about like how both of you view your role as a like as a publisher and and how that influences your writing i know i have talked to people about this before but they have you know like a big thing for them and certainly a thing for me is that oftentimes when i'm going through the submission process like reading through other people's work will illuminate things for me that i never considered and stuff when i'm like working on my own writing and I don't know about you guys, but I am my own worst enemy in terms of like, I get trapped in my head oftentimes when I'm trying to work. And so um, being able to be out, step outside of myself and being able to read other people's work is such a, an incredible experience. And, and I think in some ways, um, even though the submitters are not aware of it, it's like a act of kindness and act of generosity in a way and stuff that they're, they're even willing to be able to send their work over and vulnerability. And so it helps kind of expand my, my mind. And I just wonder, you know, how does, how does that affect your, your writing, your writing process? Um, you know, does it, does it detract from your writing process at all? Um, you know, because it takes up time to like, look at other people's work and like work on those things and stuff where it like, you know, you don't necessarily have an opportunity to like focus on your, your own writing. Yeah, like right now I'm a fan of short collections of the chapbook. Uh, I do think that with trying to publish a zine, um, whether it's one poem or six poems in collection, it changes uh, or, or kind of detracts from wanting to publish a full-length collection. Mm. But it doesn't mean that it's less or anything like that. It's just the way you are proposing it to a consumer. Mm-hmm is um, going to be a different experience than just reading a collection of work that, you know, span has spanned through years, you know? Mm -hmm. I think all, all these zines that I'm doing eventually will lead to a full-length collection that where all of it is compiled. But in that, like, intersection, I think, well, how am I going to transfer the, like, the physical object mm -hmm. as well? I think it's going to lose some of that. Now it's paying really just the yeah. all the attention to the language itself and mm -hmm. the poem rather than like what paper you used and all this but but because of that um like playfulness with mm -hmm. design that's why i like that um you can do short form content and play with the design of it or the, the texture and that's a more um i don't know like, I, I like that right now yeah. and it has totally changed my um the way i'm, I'm writing a poem Mm. Even just this past week, I released a zine called The Courier's Love, mm. and it's a poem. But it, in thinking of how you're going to flip through the poem, it completely influenced how I decided to write the piece. Hmm. I knew it was going to be a long poem, and each section had to be thought out in a way that that page was specific to that stanza. That's interesting. So, 
So like the form kind of directed the content in a way. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, and that's really with, um, I do want to shout out another press, uh, Arant Press, mm. um, led by Alan, Sorin, mm -hmm. and Tanya. And they both have very experimental form of bookmaking. They, they have like a specific phrase with it, but yeah, it's this book object. And one project that I really like from them is their matchbook. Mm. where um yeah it's like a packet of uh matches but within it alan wrote a poem that's uh, a little booklet and so it's cool. very similar to what what i did with aquarius love and it's, it's taking from that you know that bilingual page by page mm -hmm. stanza and and that's the, the experience you get with that you know and that yeah i see that um in various places and i'm like okay I, that excites me that's what i look forward to in publishing right now that's cool man I, yeah jesse what about you so as of late uh yeah honestly the people that do uh appear in the magazines uh they do kind of influence how i write now mm. i uh there was a poem i wrote recently about a skate shop and i incorporated like at least like two or three different folks um from the magazine and from not from the magazine to like form it all together. So they did definitely influence how I wrote that particular hmm. poem. And then, yeah, when I also write other poems or even prose pieces, um, I also read from like news journal style um, magazines that feature um, writers mm -hmm. and I get influences from them, even though they're considered the, the canonized folks. But yeah, for sure, for sure. That's cool. Yeah, um, Yvonne, you, you um, this is going to be the probably the second time that I've um, invoked your name in the in the podcast, but um, the uh, uh, author, um, poet uh, Anna Caretti, does a lot of her own, like, pumps out zines and stuff, like, in between, like, her books. And to your point, there's just very specific formatting that she utilizes in a lot of it, a lot of visual elements. And it's interesting that you, you talked about that, like, how do you go from like, you know, what you're doing in like the zine or a chat book and stuff, and then being able to like put that into like a larger collection and like being able to like, you know, adopt, like adapt it for like something, something longer, you know, and like what might get lost and like kind of the, you know, the movement of that. And, and I think it's interesting because it's just, it's a, you know, something that artists and writers, I think, just struggle with routinely and stuff is like, what elements do you do you keep what elements do you have to like you know let go of and stuff like you know for like if you're expanding something out or like do you want to like try to maintain everything and like having to make like difficult choices and i think that also yeah. um extends to like our roles as editors and publishers um you know thinking about like what choices we have to make and and how those choices will ultimately influence the outcome of like you know the various publications that we're that we're working on yeah, and even um, also what Jesse has been doing with Substack, like I thought that was pretty unique and has even influenced me to want to also do something online. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been like thinking of doing something with social media and like treating that as a publishing platform. Mm -hmm. And and Jesse had a cool, well, like when Systemic Dreaming came up, I was like, that's a cool name. Because <laughs> um, even in... Um, in Spanish, I'm, I was thinking of calling something Sistema Los mm. Ojos. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's just not too close to systemic dreaming. So I don't no, know. but I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> again, I mean, we're not here to like be like, hey, you're ripping me, you're copying me. You're like, don't do that. I, I would never be like that with you. That would never happen. Yeah. So. Well, we experienced that apparently, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just going to say, because uh, you had mentioned, um, Jesse, you had thrown up in the chat, um, pigeons can be sassy, and, and Yvonne said it. And I was like, that'd be kind of a cool name for, for, uh, for a zine, too, pigeons can be sassy oh, yeah. and stuff. So, you know, mm -hmm. so it's just like pulling those elements out of the air. And, and I think that, um, you know, kind of in, in the course of this conversation, I think we've really touched upon a lot of the importance again of community and like collaboration and, and being able to, you know, establish uh, relationships with, with writers, but then also thinking about how um, those writers, editors and publishers and stuff ultimately will like influence us in, in ways that are both spoken and unspoken. And, and it's really great. Um, I did want to ask both of you, you know, uh, what, projects are you guys working on and you know where our audience members can um find 
uh, more information about the publications that you guys are, are, are putting together and, and uh, your own work as well. I was going to first say that when Yvonne described the, the Aquarius scene, because I did see pictures of it at the Zine Fest, uh-huh. that it kind of reminds me of Portador, which that one I still have at my, um either, uh, either at my, at an off, at my, I have an office where I keep like poetry mm-hmm. books. Yeah. So that kind of reminds me of Portador a little bit, because that was like a long poem. And the idea of long poems are really cool, because that's how like some early like book long, like 300 page uh, books were just all, it was just all one poem. So it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that is really cool. Like, like Paradise Lost, you know? Yes, like, yeah. yeah. Or the, the Iliad or uh, the Odyssey and, you know, some of the epic epic works that are out there. But, yeah, what are you what are you guys working on? Like, um, and, you know, like, where where can uh, our audience members uh, find more, more of your stuff? I was going to say that um, right now I'm working on a second, like, I guess, mini hybrid collection um i was gonna put it out uh this month but i decided to just wait till next year because you know i just uh put out a digital uh chat book this year a hybrid collection um which i'm purposely not really advertising as much because right now number one it's hot it's too hot to advertise <laughs> um talks on skinship for example because it's about going to a korean or russian spa and hardly anyone goes to those during the summer months at least here mm-hmm. in, in southern california it's better to go to those if you want to be vulnerable um, during the winter. So I'll be advertising that book probably again a little bit in the winter time. But uh, yeah, I, I am working on a um, on a on another collection. But uh, it's gonna be yeah. But uh, I'm gonna wait till next year to put it out. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. And what about you, Yvonne? Um. Well, one is that Drifter would be doing a call for submissions. Our next theme is going to be Mi Casa a Su Casa. Mm. It's phrase, you know. Um, That's dope. <laughs> welcoming people to your house and, That's cool. you know, make it your own. And it's all in, going to be on housing, really, and perspectives of it and issues that have been happening in the city, mm-hmm. specifically of, um, you know, just homelessness, but also how we look at property, mm-hmm. you know. So hopefully that we really bring some interesting pieces and we can have a conversation about all that. And personally, you know, this um, zine that Jesse has, Dealer, has been evolving through the past year. And I want to have it out as a chat book mm. and kind of like a story, short story in verse. Mm-hmm. So I've added a, a few poems. I've reworked some of them and I want to put it out. I think right now I'm at the crux of either submitting it to a press or publishing it on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now it's in the editing phase, but definitely folks who are tuning in, be on the lookout for a final version of Dealer. And, you know, that would be like, it's like prime, <laughs> uh-huh. prime version with, and then I'll do a whole book launch and everything. So that's nice. awesome. That's, yeah, because I, I, I at my house or uh, at that office where I have the poetry stuff, I have the green one. That's the one I have. Yeah, yeah that's this awesome. is the black one that's that like the libros and stuff. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, so there's different versions out there in the world now, and as zines, and you know, now I'm like, okay, it has to be a chat book, and I have to stop yeah. editing it because <laughs> that that my, I think these poems are great. Uh, I think this is it this is going to be the final version and then nope <laughs> i mean the the poet um poet and, and very good friend of mine mark wallace um he has a serial poem that he's been working on for god knows how long um called the end of america and it is it it's he i mean this thing will be like an encyclopedia i mean it's it's big like it, you know and he releases them in in smaller you know editions and stuff but like they're yeah it's it's an ongoing work and i i love that i love that idea of like they're just being kind of a interconnectedness and like uh you know a, um ongoing conversation between you know between those pieces so that's really cool well Jesse, Yvonne, this has been an absolute pleasure. I cannot thank you guys enough for coming on today. Like, um, no, thank you. You know, yeah. I hope our I hope our listeners, um, you know, they they're able to get something from our conversation. Um, 
please go and check out their various publications. We will put links in the show notes and, um, you know, yeah, I'd love to have you guys back and, and to keep chopping it up. So it'd be great. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you awesome. for inviting us. Thank you. All right. Thank you to Ivan Salinas and Jesse Tovar for joining us on this episode. Please be sure to like and subscribe. And if you're enjoying the podcast, leave us a review. You can find our most recent and all past issues at BrokenLensJournal.com. And as a reminder, we accept submissions year round. So head to the website to submit your work there. Our theme music is composed and recorded by Art Santora. I'm Adam. And I'm Heather. Thanks for listening. Bye.